Welcome, Craig. That's the best news I've heard all day. The best news you've heard all day is that we are now recording? Correct. Uh, now I'm trying to consider, have I heard any good news? I heard some bad news. <laughs> yeah, nothing but bad news, especially if you pay attention to the news. I The only news I heard all day, because I've actually been trying to distance myself from the news a little bit, I heard somebody else's car radio loudly announcing that there was some sort of airplane accident with a hundred and something people on board. Oh, great. I didn't know about that, so I'll just add that to my pile of bad news. <laughs> yes. It's all bad news. No kidding. Nothing good ever happens, it seems like. Unless you're one of those good news Instagram feeds. Only good news here. Yeah, fuck those people. Those are the fragile babies of our generation. I mean, I suppose some some details of a bad news story are good. There are all the, hey, look, a baby, <laughs> a baby survived the hospital bombing. <laughs> okay, we'll call that a silver lining. What? Yeah, one less dead baby. Hooray, we're doing we're doing good. But our job isn't news. We're not Cody. No, we're not Cody. Cody is very good at his job and we are not. And we're going to explore maybe a little bit today of how not good at our job we are. Especially in comparison to our doubles who within very short order have completely taken over a gnome police precinct. Yeah, effectively, we might add. Very effectively. They use tactics now and everything. So even though I had said this episode this week should be fairly Tucker and Todd uh, centric, should we start off the episode with the crew and the doubles uh, getting up to some sort of maybe starting to tease out some suspicion that the Tucker and Todd they're with aren't the Tucker and Todd they know? Oh, probably. I think that's the best way to introduce the boys properly is with introducing what they aren't and having the crew start to clue in on that. That's That even opens up the uh, transitional option of them kind of setting themselves aside and being like, if these aren't who, if these aren't the boys, then where are they? And then that's our, that's our opportunity to go see the boys. Yeah. Uh, dream transition tinkle, tinkle music. Oh yeah, it's got to do that. The ooh, weird energy. So if if we are going to start the episode with the scene in which the crew are looking at the Tucker and Todd with them and going, something's off about this, should we do callbacks to some of the, the mm, plot or details or whatever, scene specifics, gags in the Limitless episode when they started recognizing something was off about Tucker and Todd? I'm... Just now recalling that uh, the only person who was actually really skeptical of us was Straight Woman. So that should probably continue to be the case. Right. Because at that, at that time, because who was it? Was it Plato was there? Yep. Plato was fully on board, which means actually maybe he should be the one who's skeptical this time. Fool me once, shame on you kind of thing. Oh, he's like hyper vigilant. He's immediately like something's wrong. But yeah, that. Exactly. That because he's doubling down on it so hard, they're easily able. They're easily able to like swindle in, him into thinking whatever I'm trying to say. Oh, you think that dude has hyper vigilance? They're actually able to convince him that they're the real deal somehow. I'm not sure. Is this a way for us to easily kick them out of the group, or do we want them hanging around for a while? Uh it's hard to say. I'm not sure whether the uh, the crew should go off on their own once again wandering in search of the boys or if we haven't done that enough already i do want a way because ultimately the one thing that i do think they should uh a, a trigger they should pull at some point is that they meet or come across the mandalorian because i like the idea of using the uh the the bounty hunter of lost like memories and ideas or whatever uh, to go hunting them down, hunting down us, I suppose. Oh, would the bounty hunter be looking for the original us or the duplicates? I'm thinking of for the original us, because they've had such a hard time sending their explosion smoke signal or whatever to come find them. Didn't work, I think, twice in a row or something like that. And then when they finally did find us, it turned out to be not us. And so they said, we need to hire a professional and, and, and send this fellow looking for us, I think. 
Oh, he's just looking for us. He's not actually going to bounty hunt us. No, because I don't, I don't, I was just describing him as a bounty hunter because the man, I don't know if all Mandalorians are bounty hunters, but the Mandalorian is a bounty hunter. So I was just using the, the, the language, but I think the Mandalorian, the man, because it's the Mandela effect. Yeah, exactly. It's the Mandela Larian. Yeah, Mandela Larian. Yeah, he's going to, he's going to come and get us because at this point we are kind of a, a mismatched memory yeah we're hazy forgotten distorted memories okay so the crew are currently at the uh the gnome police headquarters with the duplicates plato should be the first one to voice reservations straight woman probably agrees with them because she's consistent is that where they were how did they end up at the gnome because they were rescued from the can the kangaroo court and being put in jail by the pseudo intellectuals, the duplicates and an entire force of gnome cops breached that place and rescued the crew and brought them back to the headquarters. Okay, I couldn't remember where they brought them back to. I felt there I had some memory of just like a hill somewhere, but I can't remember. Couldn't that remember was that was where they extracted them to, where they met up with the duplicates. Okay, I I listened to that episode twice today. That's some research. Yeah, well, I I uh, I remembered. Rather, I came up with something funny in response to something the very first time I listened to it, and then I forgot it. So I tried to listen to it a second time in the hopes that I, it would rekindle the thought it never did. <laughs> That's a shame. So it's just lost into the ether. They say, they say you were sent on a duck goose. Yeah, I, I really was. I got goosed. I read that in the stupid shit that I follow. I follow takeaway trauma on Instagram, and it's just bad, uh, like, takeout take reviews on various websites. And one of them was screaming about how he kept phoning to try to get his delivery on time, but it was never coming on time. And they kept sending him on a duck goose, he referred to it as. That poor man. Poor I'll man. Duck goose. Anyhow. Uh... Okay, so they are at this headquarters. Are they all... <laughs> no, I'm imagining that scene from um, Blazing Saddles. Everybody's all just kind of like lazing around in the sheriff's quarters. Actually, I imagine the place is a buzz with activity as uh, the duplicates have the gnomes on high alert doing all kinds of stuff. Probably like reconnaissance and getting in touch with informational sources because I bet the duplicates are looking for us too. Oh, that's interesting. They can't fully take over our lives if we're still at large. So are are the crew at all questioning of that? Like, didn't you guys take over this place? Like, what are all these gnomes doing? The gnomes are working for us, looking for crimes. That's that's it. We're looking for crimes. Since when do you guys care about crimes? Since we joined the force. I don't know. Makes perfect sense. Stand by it. Is that is that the the group reaction then? Oh, well, that makes perfect sense. That's all they needed. Well, no, I imagine the boys would actually have a real answer. Like, this place is crazy and we need friends. This is how we got them. Like, that sounds pretty reasonable. They needed backup. They needed, to, especially because they've been there a while. They can lie about how long they've been there, too. We're all, we've gone native. I guess that would, that would be like a reasonable line of, we were, we've been here for months and it felt like, we couldn't find you guys. We didn't need to make new friends. This is our new crew. Well, not not like replace them, but we needed help finding you and and otherwise looking after ourselves here. This is a crazy, p dangerous place. Do you remember? I mean, do you remember that that uh, path that was just a, like an angry hell mouth? Gosh, I almost walked into that. This place is nuts. We need as much help as we can get. And the locals know their way around. Yeah. And we knew that somebody could probably teach these gnomes a thing or two. They have connections. Yeah, once kind of... <laughs> yeah, we've we've seen their connections. And once once they were able to find you guys, it turned out they were great at finding all sorts of other stuff, like crimes. Yeah, crimes, and of course, other people of interest. There are lots and lots of people from our Earth coming in here now. Okay, and so everybody's sold. Yes, they're sold for now, or at least they show that they're sold to the boys, but they retreat back to their quarters, which is probably a provided jail cell that's just has the door left open. And they they quietly talk amongst themselves 
Plato first, voicing his concerns and his skepticism. The boys have never been organized like this, except for one time. Does somebody in the crew, like Stan, use, like recounts, you mean that one time and it does a cutaway to a memory that has nothing to do with what Plato was talking about? Actually, it has nothing to do with them being organized at all. It doesn't even have anything to do with the boys. It's just a weird just, dream. Yeah, it's Stan just an had. opportunity for Stan to be like the center of attention for a moment. He has a thought bubble and he makes everybody else look at it. It's like an unrelated child story, yeah. And and of course, everybody will brush that off because no, no, that doesn't have anything to do with anything, Stan. Stay out of it. So <laughs> Stan play- just giggles. Is like, <laughs> much obliged. Yeah, he just enjoys obfuscating the situation. But uh, Plato and Straight Woman are initially concerned that the boys are actually just going limitless again. But of course, there doesn't seem to be the same like comic book villain levels of malevolence going on. They're just busy. Yeah, it seems almost like they're on different, they're on new medication. Yeah, now they're on Riddle In instead of Riddle Out. I'm laughing. I forget where I know that from. Sounds like a South Park thing. It does sound like a South Park thing. I was going to wonder, like, now it sounds like it also could be like a Riddler sort of thing. A a, a Riddle Me This, a a Riddle In, Riddle Out situation. Oh, interesting. Uh, I guess that means that the Riddler must be on Riddle In. That is interesting. Well, because at one point we talked to <laughs> his Jordan B. Peterson was going to be the Riddler. Yeah, he is. And he's on Riddlin. <laughs> okay, I enjoy that. Because what was he actually on? He was on some sort of like Benzo something or other. And and he's going to be defeated by giving him Riddle out. That's funny. I uh, I wanted to write notes for today's cast. And all I have in here is Vlad Dumier Puddin. <laughs> Vlad Dumier. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess that was the best I could do. <laughs> I listened to the cast twice, and that was what came out. It's not my finest hour. Do you need your Ritalin? I do. I'm unmedicated. And unmitigated. My, unmit- uh, my unmedicated state is entirely unmitigated. So, the crew are discussing that something is wrong. Maybe the boys are on a new medication. So, of course, it's time for some reconnaissance. They're going to have to spy around the precinct. Or are they going to do a sort of a Mission Impossible? I've always liked the idea of um, Stan. I'm, we might even have discussed it one time before. Stan, like, descending down on an unraveling thread from his own seams. No, oh, what's going to happen to poor Stan's seams? Is this stuffing going to fall out? Maybe a little bit does, yeah. Oh, and that's the clue that's left behind that makes the person that they're sneaking around in suspicious and come like looking after them later. Oh, I know what it is. Definitely. I definitely think Stan should use one of his loose threads to try and descend from like a ceiling vent from the ducting to collect some kind of data or evidence or information, some clue that's left on a desk somewhere. And, and yes, I think that thread should end up getting left behind because I think they uh somebody's going to get caught being a little close by and they they'll have to come up with some kind of an excuse that is originally kind of it's bought at first they buy it at first but then they discover that thread and they're like aha somebody's been sneaking around in here and that's that's when they start looking to round up the crew that's funny. The, the, they make the accusation, and Stan gives his excuse of what it was, and and the, the who I guess it would be the doubles, because is it the doubles that they're sneaking around, and then they're trying to get evidence on, and so it's the doubles that accuse them of being sneaky, and so Stan gives his excuse, and and whichever double says what fluffa, and and Stan reaches and grabs it and stuffs it back in his little hole and says, "It's cotton. Thank you very much." <laughs> cotton it's not fluff we couldn't even stuff this little boy with wool i don't know well, i mean this is the only time i assume what are stuffed animals stuffed with what are build bears stuffed with i, I assume know. there's i assume they're stuffed with just like super cheap ceiling insulation <laughs> just asbestos <laughs> uh, wouldn't wouldn't surprise me at all for like a a child-centric company asbestos and lead paint yeah, I was going to say, like, lead pellets. 
high grade polyester fiber. That's what he's going to say. Excuse you. This is high grade polyester fiber. A high grade does make it sound like a boast. Yeah, it does. I wonder who gets to decide what the grades are and if there's a mid and a low grade polyester fiber. Oh, yeah, as opposed to what other grades. And then it's just like crickets. <laughs> That's funny. Like what is like these uh, these like I don't know what the proper term for it is, but a superfluous boast or whatever. Like when they talk about uh, cars having a five star safety rating. As though it's like there are cars that don't get five star safety ratings because legally you can't produce a car that doesn't have a five star safety rating. Ours so that has means a five stars. that means they all have one big star. Like the number, the number becomes totally irrelevant. Yeah, exactly, it's meaningless. It it's just marketing. Yeah, so I don't know if there are other grades of poly or what was it polyester fiber. There is uh, only think, high grade. I think it was polyester fiber. There's just polyester fiber. Assigning it a grade, well, yeah, well, mine, mine passed a math test. Well, I guess there are construction grade fibers. Maybe he's a liar and it's actually construction grade fibers. It is just like cheap ceiling installation. I bet that's what that is. Is that is that kind of what uh, one of whoever was the other uh, double that didn't speak up? I'm assuming that Todd was the one holding up the big one, uh, holding out the fluff and saying that you guys are sneaky and then uh, uh stan grabs it back and says that's high grade polyester fiber and um tucker steps forward and says actually we that is blah 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 something something he knows somehow that it's construction grade and that's what sh that tips their hand and everybody realizes that's not tucker and todd they would never know a thing like that <laughs> that would make a lot of sense they uh s somehow they conclude that we're not going either limitless and that we're not on another medication. There are no other medications anywhere present in the place. That's what they were looking for. Of course, they were looking for our meds. There are no meds. The, uh, and we're not going full on evil villains, which means we're not going limitless. And despite not going limitless, apparently we can tell the difference between high grade polyester fiber and construction grade polyester fiber, just like because Todd touched it a little bit. Well, also because they were the, because these are social constructs that were made in a social construct factory, are they actually just stuffed things as well? That's why they know they are made out of high grade polyester fiber, and they know the difference. Oh, and Stan is a sudden, cheap knockoff. Suddenly, somebody takes a much closer look at them, and they actually look like the people from like the nightmare version of Coraline's place. <laughs> so they've got buttons for eyes and shit. Yeah, maybe. Well, and that's an interesting. That's almost actually. This is a cute little reference to Calvin and Hobbes, and in, in the in that they were just a stuffed tiger the whole time. So they're like, "Wait a minute!" And they squint at us, and they realize that there were these duplicates are actually just stuffed replicas. They've got they've got stitching, they've got button eyes. Yeah, because maybe they could do that reveal thing where one of where as the 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 doubles turn away, somebody notices zoom in camera on they have like a tag sticking out of their neck or something. Truly horrifying. Truly horrifying. Yes. Just look at those soulless button eyes. And somebody had to like manually handle those dolls all day, every day for like what four years with the button eyes staring back at you. Don't forget to smile. Yep, I would never sleep again. So it does when realizing then that, that they said after this, however long they've been hanging out together, they suddenly realize that they've got buttons for eyes and that they're fake. What are the, is it? What is Jacques? What? They just how how would the crew react? They just point and 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 declare Jacques. They run. Are they terrified? Maybe they're. Uh... Stan opens his mouth and straight woman clamps her hand over it and she and Plato play along and just say, you know what? You're right. We should probably stop skulking around the place and just go get comfortable and behave. They're, they're gonna, they're freaked out. They totally recognize these guys for the shams they are, but rather than make an immediate scene, they're actually going to make a tactical withdrawal and try to escape. Yeah, I guess I was gonna, is the plan to escape or to trap the these doubles and try to interrogate them or whatever no the plan is definitely to escape because they know they already have like an idea of what evil tucker and todd are capable of 
True. Not to and mention these guys, guys have an entire police force. Yeah, that is what I was about to say. So probably the only correct answer is to make a run for it. So they'll politely excuse themselves slowly with the kind of suspicious button-eyed glance from the Tucker and Todd duplicates. And then as soon as they're out of sight, they're going to start running. You just like hear the squeak of shoes as they go faster and faster. I guess that would give them the opportunity as they as they're making a retreat do we give them do, okay so do they do they just um as you said kind of like slink do they slink back to their rooms to plan their escape or do they just immediately beat a hasty retreat they beat a hasty retreat uh it's like a high school hallway with like wet sneakers as soon as they step out of the room that they're in you hear their squeaky shoes start moving really fast like they start running they're running down the hallway and on a flyer there is a Need someone found? Take one. You know, little number, phone number slips. They run past it, but then straight woman runs back and then tears off one of the little slips and then runs some more. That's how they meet their bounty hunter. Would this be? I feel like this is that what we've described so far is enough of an intro scene to transition to Tucker and Todd, though. So before, hmm. Well, as soon as they start running, I expect either Tucker or Todd, the duplicates, to smack a red button somewhere that causes the place to go into lockdown. But it's gnome lockdown, which means that it, the, it's really slow and bad. These guys haven't had an opportunity to overhaul that system yet, so they just like need to speak into one of their cups and strings to give the order to start closing and locking all the doors. Then I suppose the camera can do some flipping around work and... Uh, pan back to a back to front view of the duplicates so that you can't see their creepy button eyes. And then I guess that's an opportunity for the perspective to immediately shift to the proper Tucker and Todd from the same perspective. So in that sequence of events, the crew starts running away. I'm I'm almost imagining that maybe that like it's too much information text or dialogue or whatever. Too much is happening at once to uh, show what is on the poster that you just described. Maybe she just grabs the whole poster and we don't know what oh. she has grabbed. We just well, saw her grab it. But the next time we see them, she can announce what it was. I was thinking that it was a still image of a hallway that they run through. The camera doesn't move with them. The it's it's a, it's a cutaway shot of the hallway with a big flyer in it. Uh, hopefully close enough for the audience to see what's on it. It just needs to say, need someone found, and then have the, you know, old-fashioned scissor cut. Oh, it tabs. rests on it, and then it rests on it, and then you see her run out of frame. And while it's resting and zooming in, she slowly runs in and grabs the tab. I, I, I guess I get that. Yes, because now they really do need to hire a contractor. And it seems like uh, the rundown gnome cop shop would be a good place to post such a flyer. And then so and then you imagine it transitioning from a scene in which we're seeing the duplicates and then it transitions to a scene in which is the actual us. Yeah, like a, a sort of a camera pan to the other side of the room so that it's directed at the back of our duplicates, which would be indistinguishable from the backs of Tucker and Todd. And then the the scene would change around them, but it would uh Tucker and Todd would be in the exact same position. So everything else would change except for them. And then the camera can pan back around to their front facing sides and show that it's the real them. Right. In this new setting, whatever it is. Uh, yeah. Are they still in the social construct factory with Greg House? Well, I thought in the episode that they were in that factory that they had left at the end. They exited through the gift shop or whatever and it was over. That did happen but they went back to the factory to eat stroke waffle with house they were uh and and yeah they were in an end credit scene yes in which they were at they that, were it, they were in the towels again. at the deviance display sitting around together around a, a box of stroke waffle right but now we're i guess sort of presupposing that time has passed and so because more time has passed, I'm just imagining they're in a totally separate place. And since I think this week the episode is them just encountering a totally separate place, I think we're sending them outside of the outside, right? 
Quite possibly. And there's probably no way for them to get there while they're in the factory. So they do need to get out of it. I just assume that if they got... I'm comfort- imagining that if there's... Go on. I'm just imagining that if time has passed, uh, they weren't hanging out. I didn't imagine them hanging out at, at the social constructs factory. I'm imagining that they would have just kind of kept wandering and rambling and running in Twitter or hijinks they do. Well, riddle me this. If the boys found a comfortable place where they could have fun and eat stroke awful, would they really leave? Oh, that makes perfect sense. Greg House kicks them out. Well, I mean, he would have got tired of them eventually. Exactly. That's what happened. They didn't, they, they definitely didn't leave of their own accord. They don't do that, but they were, they were ejected. Greg had to get rid of them eventually. You're making the other people in the factory uncomfortable. Well, it's because all they wanted to do, Greg House would have been into them hanging around if they actually wanted to like engage in conversation or like watch movies or whatever. I don't know. Hang out and be friends, play pool. But all they wanted to do was eat stroke waffle and hang out in the deviant section. They, it, you know what? If they wanted to actually be active participants in the deviance display, House would have been on board with that too. But the boys don't, they're, they're like asexual things. They just, with the exception of Todd and his weird mommy thing, they, they don't, uh, they're confused by sex. They're not into it. Well, that's interesting. So basically, yeah, all they did was hang around and uh, watch whatever terrible show they like. Probably Jeopardy. They're still <laughs> kind of, they're still kind of holding on to that, even though they're they were only good at it once. Uh, I do and like the trouble. idea that Greg House is mad that Todd ruined the deviant section. All of the mommies quit. It's no fun anymore. <laughs> he got creepily attached. He was way too fond of them in in weird ways that they didn't like. He crossed everyone's boundaries. And he didn't even want to have sex. He just wanted to have them finger comb his hair and read him his story. None of them were into it. That's a whole other job. Yeah, and that's a different display, which Greg is now, he knows better than to ever take Todd near it. Anyhow, okay, they've been kicked out. Yeah, with a great, like a a big shoe kicks them like right out the front door so as our as our camera transitions i don't know where it's some i always imagine now we're i don't know if we got to have our we we synthesized our beach vacation scene last time so now we're actually on a, a whole other beach vacation or it's some sort of uh did did we manage to bring any stroke waffle with us i think we've got like the last crumbs of some and we're we're trading it for i don't know whatever the, what I was imagining though was that you're finishing a story is is it's the the and that and that's why I'm not allowed back at House Gregory House's social construct factory. <laughs> this will be the one time when we actually show us getting kicked out of a place, but like the all the concrete details as to why so far just points to Todd being the reason why we're not allowed there anymore. Oh, that's what you look angrily at Todd and say, and that's the reason why we're not allowed back at Kirk House's social... I can't even remember the words anymore. The factory. And that's why we're not allowed at Greg House's social construct factory anymore. And that's why I lost my pilot's license. Like, he's got all of these. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go wander to a beach. Does that mean we're going to wander to the, the dirt sea? Well, I mean, if we do wander to the dirt sea, then we would come across individuals i don't know what we, if we have anything to do with them right now but also since we've already done the beach thing a couple times maybe you were in some sort of transportation depot a transportation depot like a great big bus stop yeah like an outside greyhound whatever system they have going on and guess what it's gnome hound <laughs> oh no no <laughs> yeah transportation in the outside leaves much to be desired so are they like little rickshaws then? Oh yeah, each one is actually pulled by a team of gnomes, like they're like they're huskies. Are we are we uncomfortable about that? Like I don't know about this. Yeah, we're very uncomfortable with it, especially after we saw how slow they went. Because the gnomes just walk. They're like, hold on to your potatoes, and then they just start walking. <laughs> I was just trying to imagine. My sometimes they they go hold on to her and they're interrupted by a, a bunch of potatoes start rolling around and yeeing wahooing around in the in the back of the rickshaw. Oh gosh, a potato gag. Yeah, I told you to hold on to those. 
Dr. Jones. Junior. In Greek. I uh I gave Sean Connery's older uh older dad the uh worst father of ever medal in that film. Worst father ever? Yeah, after they both wound up sleeping with the same woman. I don't remember that happening. Is that what happened? That does indeed happen, although to be fair, Senior got to her first. The blonde lady who is a Nazi? Yes. Yes, and uh, it's just as well that she did not survive the escape from that tomb. She did not choose wisely. Oh, right. I remember now. I was going to say, it's been so long since I watched that film. I don't remember how she went out, but she was there with the old knight and whatnot. She didn't die sipping from the wrong cup. That was actually one of the other Nazis. She, the whole place was collapsing into like a bottomless pit and all that. And she wound up falling with it. She got greedy. So she didn't get out of there in time. She was like, I got to stay behind and collect some treasure or something to that effect. Whatever it was, she wasn't in enough of a hurry to leave. (laughs) That was, she should have been in a hurry. That's what I took away from it. Yeah. Everybody else was in a hurry to leave and they survived. So that was her mistake. Should have read the room. Yeah, especially the part where the entire thing was collapsing. Read that part of the room, you will be in a hurry to get out. Okay, so what the hell are we doing with our boys, though? I, I guess it doesn't really matter where we stick them. We still need to figure out where they're, what they're ending up doing. Okay, are they running okay, I know, I know, state? I know exactly what they're doing. They've got just a, a couple of stroke waffles left. They're now bartering for a ride. There's only one place on the available docket that they can afford to go, and that is the natural state. Oh, do they run into George Carlin doing the ass, grass, or gas? <laughs> nice. Okay. One of the gnomes is George Carlin now. He's he's the one at the front of the, the husky line for the for the one that they're able to get uh the one that they're able to afford. Or maybe he should be like in a in a chair somewhere with a whip that cracks so that he can direct the other gnomes. I'm trying to, because he, he was in one of those Thomas the Tank Engine things, Shining Time Station. I think he was a, 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 what is it called? The guy who sits on the end of the train, the conductor or whatever? Yeah, conductor. So is he the Yes, he is, he is, he is conducting this particular, all I can actually see now is a husky sled in my mind. The like, teams of gnomes hooked up to husky sleds. Yeah, pretty much. And then there's like a little chair just ahead of the spot where the person riding the sled would be standing. And in it sits the, the lead gnome who cracks the whip. So are we in sort of a, a not that it's necessarily snow, but the environment is more something, some sort of powdery? Like it's, it's like a, a, it's a, a really, dune. It, yeah, a really powdery sand, like ultra fine. But it's still outside colors. Oh yeah, it looks kind of you know you know that artificial sand you get for a fish bowl that's all multicolored. Looks like that. Looks like an oil yeah. slick in uh, in a shitty parking lot. Hang on, just one moment, please. No problem. All right, I have returned. Welcome. I uh, poured myself a glass of water and then I left it somewhere far away. It was truly a journey. Yeah, I uh, I was very thirsty. Okay, so the boys have a few morsels of stroke waffle left. They are going to use it to barter for passage anywhere that isn't this weird multicolored desert. There's only one fare that they can afford, and it happens to be little Gnome Carlin's team. I enjoy that. That we just I don't care where we go, we just gotta get out of this place. Yeah, that seems to me like their kind of energy. Anywhere but here. I don't like this place. It hurts my eyes. Everybody around is creeps. Yeah, everybody here is weird. I kept trying to touch my shoulders and like whisper in my ear, I hate that. And then Todd just has a wistful look because all the mommies left. It's really shook him to his core. (laughs) He hasn't spoken since. I think that as, uh, as... The box of stroke waffle cookies changes hands. That's an opportunity for the camera to zoom way in on them and to make for an ad break. An ad break for the stroke waffle? 
yeah, it zooms right in on the box of Stroke Waffle, so you can see the 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 brand name, and then it's just like the bam, and then it's it's like a a really old fashioned commercial where the the Stroke Waffle box is in the middle of like a multicolored star, and then like the rest of the screen is just like a single pastel color. Stroke Waffle available now. Is it Annabelle's voice that does this? The 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 as we said, she's the spokesperson for the brand. Oh, I like that. She should be. That would definitely be her thing. She like she loves them so much that she was willing to kick her way into a crashed airship that was still kind of on fire in the middle of the uh, verse, very first like death throes of the apocalypse, and she was eating them to the screams of everybody else on the island. Oh, does the stroke waffle also have the rushed side effects uh, announcement speech? The exact same one as the blue pills <laughs> verbatim. <laughs> but I do think that would that would be a a good moment to have a brief clip where we get an ad segment for the stroke waffle. I'm just not sure how to advertise a product that doesn't solve a problem because I want to do it infomercial style, but I don't know how they sell snacks. Yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't well, that seen was a the snack thing. commercial in like 20 years. The one. Th- one thing I was thinking was since we were accused of doing uh, a masculine ad last week, I thought it would be funny if Stroke Waffle was a feminine product. A feminine product? Yeah, like a, it contains a medicinal ingredient. Ah. Uh, which stops cramping or something. Oh, interesting. Then why the hell do the boys like it so much? And house. Well, I don't like Scooby Snacks so much. They're just, I don't know. I think it we can just make it, it feminine enough by having a just by having Annabelle be their celebrity spokesperson. Oh, well, I mean, it could be that they like it so much just because it tastes so good, and that could. I mean, it if you want it to be, good. that could be a statement thing on all the all the all the foods and drinks that people, for whatever reason, refer to as girly are extremely yummy because they've got all sorts of good flavors in them. I don't know. They call it a feminine product, but they taste damn good to me. They're they're called Ladies' Choice. That's their rebranding. Yeah, Ladies' Stroke Waffle. Oh, are they selling a new version of the Stroke Waffle that's specifically for ladies? Or is it the other thing where it's always been a ladies' product and now they're selling the men's version in the gray package? <laughs> in the gray package, it has chest hair. Yeah, men's Stroke Waffle. But then we're it... doing another masculine ad. <laughs> That's true. I guess we could double down and make it hyper masculine and then not only does the box have some chest hair and like abs but like down low it has like a a, a censored mosaic thing hanging down. The, oh, the, but the box whole... has the box has truck nuts. Yeah, it's all there's all like monster trucks and motocross and whatnot. The guy doing it, it's <laughs> it's a get done by a guitar riff and it's like yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the Sunday Sunday Sunday. <laughs> Now for men. <laughs> oh yeah, so that's how the commercial starts. Then is it's like it's a nice little like backyard party everybody's having there. There's maybe like violin music, or whatever. There's a nice little backyard um, evening cheese and crackers oh, party. Everybody's having yeah, their stroke waffle. It's, it's got like Vivaldi playing in the background, or like yeah. a really a really light flute score, something delicate. And then there's just suddenly an explosion of pyrotechnics and there's all these like motorcycles and monster trucks like break down the picket fence and yeah, whatever. Yeah, and start running roughshod all over the yard. It's like Fury Road. It, like the actually, yeah. <laughs> We got a guy with a motorcycle. Uh, or Yeah, he's on a motorcycle, but he's not. He's standing on it and he's playing a guitar that shoots fire. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, now for men. Yeah. For these like cookie things, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just dumb little waffle cookies that used to be marketed to women, and now now they're rebranding for men. I guess we're making another masculine ad. Stick to what you know. Well, I mean, where as the commercial itself zooms out of that scene to a little girl watching the commercial, and then she turns to her feminist mother and says something along the lines of, that, that seems toxic to me or whatever. Why don't they make ads for women? Blah, blah, blah. These cookies used to be for ladies. I think that's what her mother says. And then the little girl says, fuck you, mom. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, I like that. Yeah. Her mom is a, is a helicoptery millennial mom. 
But the girl and, was and like, this is, a, this is a kid watching yeah. monster trucks and thinking about monster trucks, the things that kids think about them. She thinks this is awesome. It's monster trucks. It's loud noises. It's bright flashing lights. It's very engaging. She's like, fuck you, mom. This is awesome. That being said, do you watch any Channel 5 stuff? Uh, All Gas, No Breaks? I don't watch any channel anything. Oh, well, it's it's a YouTube channel, but he used to, his channel used to be called All Gas, No Breaks. But he changed it to Channel 5 so that when he goes to uh, political conventions and such, people take him more seriously. Oh, that's cool. It's um, me from Channel 5. Yeah, exactly. But he went to the most recent American convoy, which was trying to get underway after, like, at the same time that Ukraine was becoming a thing. Uh, <laughs> no more news left for you. Yeah, no more news. Exactly. Uh, but there was, they, they had a group of people, like, on the side of the highway giving their support to the convoy as it drove by. And so he went and interviewed these kids. They all, like, 10 years old. And he just sticks the mic in this one kid's face and says, what you thinking of the boat? And the kid goes, goes going home. He goes, why? What are you thinking of going home? He says, because it's cold. And he asks the other kid, what are you thinking about? He says, trucks. Why? What do you like about trucks? They're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's uh, that checks out. That's this kid. She's like, this <laughs> yeah, is awesome, kids. mom. I want some stroke waffle now. Yeah, exactly. So it's a masculine and children ad because turns out that monster trucks are for everybody. But can they tell why kids love Stroke Waffle for kids? Stroke Waffle for kids? It turns out there's a little baby uh, monster truck riding behind the big one. Now for kids. And it cuts to George Carlin doing a bit about get your whole family fat. There's his, hers, and babies get fat Stroke Waffle. Oh, yeah. And then he, yeah, sauteed raccoons assholes on a stick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, he, then he gets to, yeah, go into a little tirade about fat consumerists. Fat consumers. Is that how we break? So we have that whole commercial going on, and then it explodes in a little poof of thought clouds. It's being disrupted by Gnome Carlin complaining as the, the, the convoy drives forward. I was actually thinking that Gnome Carlin would uh, be, like, he'd be there, but he would reach up and, like, rip it rip down the entire scene like it was a piece of paper yeah, that always works too it's like that's enough of that some some kind of dismissive carlin phrase it's all bullshit and it's bad for you i don't know big time pig time because because yeah it is big time pig time but the, i do think that it should be our thought bubbles but somehow he's capable of grabbing onto it and like ripping it off the off the screen and is that way his way of like okay we're here is that our time hop Oh, yeah, that's probably a great way to do a travel scene, an ad break. And, and so he's like, we're here and we're like, we know, we still we still we just said anywhere but there. Where are we? Yeah. Where is here? This is the last stop. This is where your money runs out. Get off. Oh, is it the diner at the edge of the universe or whatever that thing was called? Oh, interesting. Wherever we are, it should be at least near to the natural state. Right, I'm trying to think of what a segue of that would it. I mean, what is there any way we if we were just taken to the natural state? Well, that's where he that's where he brought us. That's the only place we could afford to go, and it is the crappiest place in the outside. Oh, uh, have we already introduced that? That that's why we're here is because this is this is the crappiest place that we could go, that in the outside. Well, we that was what we could afford. We could only afford the cheapest crappiest ride and it turns out that the cheapest crappiest ride goes to the cheapest crappiest destination so is it sort of like a cheap hotel we first get there like when you get to a cheap hotel like they've dumped all of their money into the lobby the lobby looks kind of nice but as soon as you move like into the elevators you're like oh no this place is a dump does the natural state even have a hotel or do we does it actually is it actually like a big cardboard cutout and we open the door and we just walk right through it well, I'm not saying it's like a hotel, but I'm saying when we first arrive there, they have like the big welcome to the natural state sign. And that's a very nice sign. And we get out and we're kind of like, oh, well, this looks like it could be kind of OK. And then maybe that's when that sign blows over and it was made out of cardboard. I don't know. Oh, the sign blows over and there's some kind of nasty thorny plant behind it. Turns out the entire place is a horrible, 
nasty, painful shithole. I don't know. I have actually forgotten. So what was the premise of the natural state? Because I, I remember that it was... I, I can't remember that the whole thing was that it was a play on... It's a it's a play on opposition to everybody thinking that natural is best. That, it, oh, it uses all natural ingredients, or it's a natural home remedy, or this, that, other thing. Nature is not good. Nature is neutral at best, and sometimes it's actively malevolent. Smallpox so, is nature. So hypothetically, this place started off not being natural, and then somebody declared we need to go all natural? And yes, that exactly. Ran amok. Exactly. This it's it's basically a post-apocalyptic town in the outside. At one point, it was a thriving community, and then a growing political force decided to turn it to closer to nature, ultra conservative, even more than the most ultra conservative we've ever heard of. So, like, we need to go back to how things were in our natural state. So, just exploring. In the history, was it like a, a, a settlement of people that just ended up there and then it happened to just become a society that was able to say, let's go to back to a natural state? I'm going to assume it was actually an entire community that got sucked into the outside. And that was when there was a big political shift during that state of upheaval. So did it get sucked into the outside like in the late 90s when everybody was starting to get alarmist about um natural states and whatnot also it's full of anti-vaxxers because that's not natural those kinds of people so of course everybody got sick so they're all like radical hippies yes of the worst kind but they're they're more like hunter gatherers now we get to do a bit of an echo of that sort of regressive society that we found living in the uh cracked open components of that big ship once upon a time what what happened to the thought yacht? Right. They had dissembled into ultra tribalism. They went Lord of the Flies. So how I get, okay, now that we've how large of a place are we dealing with then that we've come to? It's probably just a town. It would be really difficult to convert an entire city or a nation to uh the natural state. So it's a small run down town. Everything is broken, all the windows are shot out. It's an infested hellhole are there other, since everybody split off into their various tribes are there other towns nearby that like were more successful or lucrative or whatever because they didn't regress to this natural state i assume if this place broke down into tribalism it would mostly be those who wanted the natural state and those who rejected it and anybody who rejected it was probably uh exiled so they've gone on to create their own little commune somewhere, probably nearby. And I'll bet you it's like a utopia with like bullet trains and like all kinds of sophisticated medical technology. But you can't get in without a permit. And you have to know a guy to get one of those. Yeah. So it'll it'll be highly advanced, but it turns out it's mildly oppressive as a utopia. You need a permit for everything, including just coming in. So are we... Like I don't, I know. What we do you came mean? You don't have a number. citizen number. What? Where's your barcode? So are we actually? In, how are we interacting with these places? Like I know that we've suggested that they exist, but I don't really know what Tucker and Todd are gonna do in them. Well, Tucker and Todd are gonna go for a walk through the one path that leads through the natural state. But once they saw that it was like ugly and unwelcoming and inhospitable, would they actually even want to? Well, they turned around only to see that, you know, George, Noam Carlin had, was already leaving, the, leading the sled team far away and everything behind us was more of that multicolored desert that we didn't want to see any more of. So we, we just have the one choice. Might as well go see. Maybe it's not as bad as it looks. Maybe they've got a mercantile. We can buy more stroke waffle. Yeah, maybe they've got stroke waffle. Is, is this now our Scooby snack? Oh, definitely. And I think the the first time Stroke Waffle gets mentioned out loud after the ad, it should play a little riff from the ad, just like in the background. Oh, it now has its own theme music. Yeah, like a little three note guitar jingle. Diddly diddly do. <laughs> and since since we've got nowhere else to go and nothing else to look at, we might as well go on into the natural state. We can't. We're not aware of the the nicer commune down the street. As far as we know, this is all there is. So we might as well go in and have a look. Yeah, we don't, we don't, 
we don't learn about the nicer state until we're stuck trapped in the natural state. Oh, trapped, you say? What do we... Does somebody, like, do we fall into, like, some kind of preset trap? One of those one of those ankle ropes that suspends you from a tree? That good old chestnut? I'm not sure, and I'm not actually sure why we would be trapped there. I was just imagining some sort of Hotel California situation. I think we're just going to wander it for a while because it's probably more or less a ghost town. If there's anybody still living there, they're in hiding. We're going to have to... We're going to wander into town, start looking around. All the windows are broken out. All the buildings are overgrown or just like rubble. Uh, wildlife is out of control. And we definitely wind up getting caught in a snare trap because snare traps are comedy gold. I'm just trying to think if there was any, if there's any pop culture references worth crossing over with being in like, I've got nothing. Whoops. Slipped and disappeared. Yeah, but I'm here now. If you were looking for a reference, we could probably do an I Am Legend somewhere. Is that the concept of what I Am Legend was? Was naturalism gone too far? No, but the world was returning to a natural state now that people didn't live in it anymore. I don't know if there's any, uh, any bit of literature or film on naturalism gone too far because it's just too ridiculous. It's almost Python-esque. Well, yeah, I'm trying to figure out, do we have, because uh, I feel like there should be some, I don't know, the the giver character who is like the keeper of knowledge about the history of these people who comes out and talks about why it is in this state. Like, I don't know if it's enough, just we need somebody telling us what happened there for well, the joke to be sold. Well, we, I, that's why we're in the snare trap. The few people who are still here are now going to find us. And I was going to definitely include a giver type guy the, the the village wise man who is old enough to remember the way things were but i mean would that wise man look back on he he speaks about everything that the people did to get to this point as though it were folly does he pass judgment or is that simply the way is it simply the natural way of the world maybe he bought into the press oh and he's still like an acolyte of the belief system he's trying to sell it to us yeah look the the way the world was was terrible we were we were hungry and sad and then a couple of people chime in i'm hungry i'm sad you need, every single point he comes up with to vilify the world that was left behind is still present in some way because they're just innately tied to the human experience and then it can break down into a python-esque argument between these villagers you know well that's only because you don't brush my teeth that was from something already. Yes, that's from the three-headed giant guy in uh, the Holy Grail. But it's an opportunity for them to break down into an argument over how all the factors that they left behind are still present. Well, I didn't vote for you. And then you said a follow-up is a hard extreme turn to the opposite assumption that nature is actively malevolent and needs to be conquered. So is that another town just over the hedge or whatever? Should that be another town, or do we somehow manage to convince these people that nature is evil and needs to be destroyed? I think when it comes to extremists, it's actually easier to convince them of the opposite extreme than it is to convince them of some kind of midpoint. Well, because you can say, look what believing in it got you to. Your belief in it is what made all of this happen. So technically, nature is evil. It made you believe that it was good. And then now they want revenge on nature. Is that... The kind of argument Tucker and Todd can make, or would they say something like, yeah, but stroke waffle? Well, I think if their argument was, yeah, but stroke waffle, then these people wouldn't do anything. They would do anything for stroke waffle. Do they know what stroke waffle is? We're going to introduce them to it. And then that incentivizes them to go to yeah. war against nature? Tucker still had one cookie in his pocket. The entire commune shares it between themselves. They become convinced Nature can't create something like this, but something this good can't be evil, so nature must be evil. But now Todd hates Tucker for keeping one last secret stroke waffle secret? Yeah, I would be mad about that, too. Why didn't you tell I me thought, you had that I in thought, your pocket? I thought you said we were all out. You were saving that for yourself. Now we've got conflict. We could have gone somewhere else. <laughs> we could have gone somewhere. We had a whole other stroke waffle. This is what half a stroke waffle got us. Imagine what three times that would have been. 
then then Tucker kind of just lowers his head in shame. He's an addict now. The, or he tries to defend himself. He's like, no, look, now we got all these idiots. We were saying, who are we saying? We would said that we'd become these people's stupid king. This is how. Yeah, probably. If if these guys are if these guys are stupid enough to buy into the stroke waffle, then Tucker and Todd are just a little bit smarter than they are. But all they had was the one. So it's sort of like a drug pusher kind of situation where it's like, OK, you've had your taste. You, you can all get as much stroke waffle as you can imagine, but you have to join together and focus your energies and whatnot. Do as we say. It's time to reject nature and embrace the stroke waffle. Does that is that where we we zoom out? This is where we're gonna do a transition back to the crew and what what they're doing with their uh, I can't remember what, <laughs> what they were doing. No, they are they just narrowly escaped the uh, gnome police headquarters because the lockdown procedures are really as slow as everything else the gnomes do. Right, they are they are gonna now uh, they've got their number to contact the mandalorian but to do the transition they say we do the the uh do as we say reject nature and embrace stroke waffle and then it does a fourth wall break where it zooms out to a family watching once again the tucker and todd show and oh it's the same girl from before and the girl says they really are harping in on this product placement lately (laughs) corporate sellout fucks (laughs) yeah (laughs) this is one cheeky kid these solo soulless corporate sellouts and then yeah it's an opportunity for rather than to actually show the crew's escape because i think if we do the previous scene with them well enough with how slow all the lockdown procedures are going the their escape can just be implicit and we can come back to them in a scene where straight woman is like all right he said to meet at these coordinates and i think and and craig says that's where we are so I guess we just wait because they've already contacted the Mandalorian and he's now going to meet them here. They're probably in like a little ravine somewhere. Yeah, I like that. And, and and it's purple. The ravine is purple. The terrain is purple. I don't know why. It's just meant to be. So how is the Mandalorian going to appear? I'm trying to remember. Okay, so things that have been famously associated with man. There's the Berenstain Bears. Oh man, you remember that their issue on being racist? I don't. It was a Berens- it was a Berenstein Bears issue about immigrants and the uh, the bears next door were pandas. Those aren't even bears. And it was about it was about being tolerant and open minded and welcoming. But of course Berenstein Bear Dad is all, you know, grumble nuts about these panda neighbors. Coming into our bare neighborhoods. All of the examples are so minute. All the examples of the Mandela effect? Yeah. Like, none of them are really, like, hugely culturally important. Except for the part where everybody thought Mandela was dead. A whole bunch of other I think I think that was the origin of the Mandela effect. Yeah, that's what it's based on. Everybody just erroneously thinking, oh, no, shit, that guy's dead. I was. It would just have been cool if there was some like. There's one. There's like the Flintstones. Whether there's a T in the name or whatever, Flintstones or Flintstones. Looney Tunes. Looney Tunes whether the tunes them. is spelled with two O's. Fruit Loops. It's all a lot of spelling. That's because people don't pay really close attention to those stupid and unnecessary details. The Fruit of the Loom logo. Was there a cornucopia in it or not? I thought it was just grapes. I was always more preoccupied with how looms make fruit. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> I guess I only just literally thought of what that would be. A loom is what you weave with, and the fruit of the loom is woven things. The fruit of the loom is the whatever the loom creates, the product of the loom, whatever it yields. Yeah, exactly. But I didn't know that. I just was like, loom fruit, whatever. Well, trees have limbs, so why wouldn't they also have looms that could bear fruit? Because trees don't weave cloth. And also, in if you're familiar with, uh, with Roman Catholic prayers, Jesus is the fruit of Mary's womb. So fruit of the womb and fruit of the loom were very similar in my mind. I thought I was talking about babies. You always put it on your junk anyways. Yeah, I sure did. I had lots of fruit of the loom. 
I had a lot of Fruit of the Loom until a girlfriend told me that Fruit of the Loom was for poor people. <laughs> yeah, well, then I made Fruit in her loom. I made sure not to. Oh, is that the way around we're supposed to do it? <laughs> yeah. I've been I've been making terrible mistakes all this time. I made Fruit in her loom. It's pretty gross. Yeah, well, nobody cares what you think, Todd. That's mean. <laughs> yeah, okay, go tell your mommy. I can't. She's gone. Where were we anyway? We were transitioning to the crew. Right. We need man the Mandalorian to show up. I just can't think of a cool way that he would. I mean, we could always play it straight and he shows up via jetpack. I mean, that is interesting if he is dressed as the Mandalorian. And, and is he kind of like mad and snippy that everybody always, oh, confuses him? No, that's the Mandalorian. I'm the Mandalorian. I, is hunt, the, a... I hunt a very particular kind of prey. It's a Mandela effect thing. I I'll I will assume that straight woman made contact with him since they arranged a meeting. She managed to tell him the kind of people he would be looking for, or at least enough about them that they've qualified for his expertise. They're some kind of like improperly remembered thing. That could be referenced to in like she starts to explain why they've asked him to come and he says, I know, you explained it all on the phone. Or on the <laughs> note. Uh, that's the on the gnome phone. That's why she didn't have a long conversation. Everything on the gnome phone just takes too long. So just, just need to meet, send coordinates. So I don't know. Does he get right down to business? So who are we looking for? Who are you, and how did you find me? You, your flyer that was right in the police precinct. Oh, right. I did put that there. Oh, does it, he launches into like customer satisfaction survey? How did you find our flyer? And now, would you say it helped you? It was mostly satisfactory. Oh, man, that is a perfect way to make people feel like you're super wasting their time in a place that doesn't even have time. So, yes, I definitely think that that is like, oh, you found one of our flyers. What would you rate your customer experience so far? And thus comes a little survey. Can we do this later? Fill it in now for a, for a chance to win. Win what? A boat. It shows a picture of something that's anything but a boat. Yeah, it it uh it has wheels, but it's, it's just a ramshackle thing. But it works on the dirt sea. So once the survey concludes, it's just a series of really generic, uh, strongly disagree, disagree, neither agree, strongly agree questions. We've all answered a bajillion of those. Well, I almost feel like would would straight women actually would turn the interviewer around on him and say, listen, well, I don't have to answer any of your questions. I want to know about you and they need some sort of proof of like, tell us what kind of work you do. How can you find our friends? What's some like given us an example of a job that you've done before that proves that you can find our missing friends? I actually think that's probably a very good point. And she would definitely be the kind of person who would turn that around. So yes, I agree. We need, we need you to establish your credentials. So maybe it's an opportunity for her to also tear down the scene in a similar way to how Gnome Carlin did. And she's like, hold on. We're not going to do any of that. First, you're going to tell us something. And, and then she proceeds to launch a proper uh, In that case, does it become... Go on. In that case, does it become a different scene then when he launches into customer service survey mode? Is he put on a different costume? Well, no, I think it's just because this this survey sheet takes over the screen. Oh, okay. And she, Looney Tunes, rips it down. And then she starts questioning him full Inquisition style and gets him to start establishing his credibility, which is where he gets the opportunity because Stan is going to be like, oh, Oh, I recognize this guy. He's the Mandalorian. And he's like, and then the Mandalorian has to get upset about that and say, no, common error. We we are not the same guy. I am not that guy. I have a totally different job. And then he explains precisely what it is that he hunts down. And it's these misremembered things. Is he also sort of bitter and whatever over the fact that the Mandalorian got a television show before he did is he's been trying to get a Mandalorian like reality series in, in, in production for, for years. And it, it keeps just running into problems. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, 
the Mandalorian is getting all the shine? Uh, yes, definitely. He should be bitter about the Mandalorian's higher level of success and recognition. Nobody ever confuses the Mandalorian for the Mandalorian for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Oh, by the way, was it uh, was this Howie Mandel plays the Mandalorian? Mandalorian? The Mandalorian? I think that would be really funny because then he doesn't want you to touch him. And also because his career is also sort of like a, a forgotten, misremembered thing. Oh, so he is not only hunting down the victims of the Mandela effect, but he is a victim of it himself. Yeah. I don't know if that's an unnecessary jab at Howie Mandel. He's a judge on every other show that exists. I think that's fine. The only thing I can clearly remember about him is that he's a germaphobe. Yeah, that's sort of what he's famous for. Okay, so it's definitely Howie, although nobody can tell under his helmet. He's, it's just his voice. One of these days, it'll come off and it'll be Howie. Yeah. But no, his, his response to being confused for the Mandalorian is bitter and defensive. And everybody's like, whoa, hold on. Don't get don't don't get your stroke waffles in a knot. So he explains what it is that he does. They explain what it is that they need. They they decide together that Tucker and Todd are close enough to be worth hunting after for this guy. Yeah, is by the end of it, he's like, Okay, well I did just explain what I do and you guys were listening, right? <laughs> like, yeah. He's like, Well, I don't really look for missing people. And they're like, but you said, and it's it's one of those two hours later, maybe. And he's like, okay, fine, whatever. I need the work. You would obviously need something to do. Yeah, <laughs> I, whatever. That's fine. I need the work, and you need to stop talking. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's, uh, that's an opportunity for a straight woman to badger him for two hours until he's just been fully strong-armed into to doing what she says. She's browbeat him. I think that means that uh, the Mandela Lorian is actually going to wind up following their trail, but he's going to catch them, not or not catch them. He's going to catch up with their trail and meet Greg House at the Social Constructs Factory. He's following their trail, so he's going to have to talk to Greg House. Would they get along? Greg House doesn't get along with anybody. And after how he sees the... Uh... The oh the god, the, the, oh god, <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna see a, a number of exhibits that are going to disturb him. He's gonna slip in what he hopes is just an oil slick near the deviance display. Okay, but I think now that we've got that character established and met up with the crew and sent on his task, is that enough to pivot back to Tucker and Todd to kind of like finish off the rest of the episode to, with whatever they're doing? Oh yeah, sure. In fact, we can probably come back to them just being in charge now. They've been they've already already been elected as the leaders of this this little commune now by a unanimous vote of 5 because there's only 5 people still left alive. 7 now that the that Lord Tucker and Todd are there. And so now that they uh, this 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 commune has taken back and fi fighting back against nature, is it now in sort of a state of utopia? Is it no. an instant change? Nope. Uh, because unfortunately, they're starting from scratch. So their development is basically all they have to uh, assault nature with are like some sticks and stones. They're just, they're probably going out there and just like chopping some grass down. They don't really have the means. They just have a radically changed attitude now. So this has adjusted their attitude then though. The, so is it, but is everybody happy? Has it changed life for them in any way? No, everybody's the exact same kind of miserable but just way more active. So they need the calories from the stroke waffle. And but where do they get their stroke waffle from then? I think Tucker and Todd have to discover the nearby uh commune and start stealing stroke waffle from them. We need to keep up this sort of ruse that we're in that we're somehow capable of bringing the stroke waffle would would the the people now invigorated and and whatever by the their change in life would they not just declare war against that commune we're so we're going in and we're they've got okay are they aware of the commune or is it just us who's aware of the commune well you said that when we got there we would have no awareness of the commune and of course these people would be aware of the commune because they split off from each other at some point did they not yes the 
highly sophisticated and advanced commune is aware that there's a little dirt hovel full of nature lovers. The nature lovers have no idea that the other commune exists. They haven't had the means to detect them or communicate with them. They can't see them past the tall shrubs. And so how did we become aware of it then? Well, we stepped slightly to the left, just enough to see it past the tall shrubs. Turns out none of them have ever quite gone that way. These guys are idiots, man. And so we just start sneaking in and breaking in. So do we have? So do Hang we on. go to that place then? Like, how do we discover that they have stroke waffle? You remember that episode of The Simpsons where Homer had a crayon up his nose? I didn't watch The Simpsons. Shame on you. There, Homer's doctor prints off scans to sh to look at and to show Homer. And the way he holds it, his thumb was always over the spot that was important in this particular episode. Consistently, his thumb was covering up the crayon that was all the way buried in there. It turns out okay. that Homer had, Homer had had this crayon up his nose for his entire adult life. <clears throat> and that's why he's stupid. But the doctor never noticed it because ever since he had been Homer's doctor, his thumb had always covered up this crayon just because he'd always hold the sheet in the on same the, place. On the x-ray? Yeah. It, same principle. These guys have never looked in that direction except from the same position. The, okay, the, but... the, little, the little tall shrubs have always blocked the other neighboring city. So we took a step to the left and we saw this place and we just went over there and said, hey, do you guys have stroke waffle? Can we have some? I'm pretty sure that they have a stroke waffle factory and we can see it. And so we somehow trick those people into thinking that we're okay, guys, or we we become we, we, we need to infiltrate cat burglar. Cat burglar. It's especially easy because Todd is a cat. So we do some Pink Panther music as we cat burglar our way in. Oh yeah, I'm I'm I want the Pink Panther music. I think we need to do it in in the the full cartoony getup too, where we're we're in like black turtlenecks and pants with the black beanie hats on that we pull yeah, down over our faces but they're on backwards and but so we're actually successful at being cat burglars though well these this super sophisticated society is like wally's society nobody's actually in a position to do anything about it they don't even notice us turns out they don't care they're they're some kind of cross between uh the wally humans and the humans from equilibrium so they're all on like happy drugs and they're also just like fat and complacent. Uh, it is sort of funny. I like the idea that uh, if they're Wally humans, somebody, somebody sent this other neighboring village into that village. Exactly. <laughs> they're going to become exactly the same kind of people. Just their, their entire society is going to revolve around developing industry to make more efficient uh, production for stroke waffle. You can distract, you can distract, motivate, and incentivize any group of broken people with stroke waffle or consumption, I should say. Mmm, stroke waffle. <laughs> yeah, like it, it, it. it becomes an advertisement somehow. Is the 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 fat the sad fat Wally people all all grazing like cattle on their on their stroke waffle, and they go mmm. And they're, they're not they're not sad at all they're very happy or at least they think they are they they're not fulfilled but their needs are met yeah they are they are actively happy but when i look at them i am sad yes when i when i think about how hollow and empty their lives are and how full their bellies are but I'm at the sad. same time they make me want stroke waffle i wish stroke waffle was a real thing but yes, that, that is their destiny now that we are beginning to introduce Stroke Waffle to this, what could be considered a virgin society. It would be like bringing iPhones and porn to some of those undiscovered, untouched, like still in their prehistoric state tribes that exist in the untouched corners of Earth. Yeah. Give, like giving them instant gratification machines of some kind. Was it you would, ever read it about would those? Them. Well, the, I can't remember which it, they called them cargo cults. John Frobisher, I think, was the name. Let me look at this name. John, who to what now? Maybe it wasn't. Fr oh, from John from. They were the, John from. Did you say frickin' John from? Frickin' John from very closely related to From Software. 
Yeah, it is. But this is with a U, I believe. No, it was this guy, what they call oh. the, the Tana Islands, I think. Well, then you have to pronounce it Froom. Froom, yeah. It's got an umlaut. On the island of Tana, I think the idea, he, the, I believe John Frum was the guy that found, or Froom, found these people, uh, which were like South Pacific islands. And after, after World War II, a lot of the uh, like cargo that had been jettisoned from ships and planes in the area was like washing up on their shores. And so they had all of these supplies for the U.S. military and the U.S. Air Force. Um, but they believed that they were set, the people from these islands believed that these supplies were sent to them from by whatever weird gods they believed in. And so ah, they started. Sh Shibalba finally gives back. <laughs> yeah, exactly and so they crafted all of these like insane um memorials or whatever you want to call them uh effigies in honor of of airport like american shaped planes and military apparel and whatnot it was very inter interesting stuff yeah that seems pretty normal to me they had with none of the context of what any of those things are or what they're for they'll just assume yeah, so that'd be sort of interesting in a way if uh, if the the stroke waffle for these people is like the the what do you call it the spring not a spring of eternal youth but like the the forbidden fruit it's the 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 fruit of forbidden knowledge whatever it is it's magical to them that's that's definitely true they are all about it and and like their neighboring commune which will eventually these two uh, towns will kind of grow and envelop each other and become one but they'll they'll be completely indistinguishable by the time that does happen because tucker and todd will continue to like not just steal stroke waffle but like steal bits and pieces of fabrication technology used to make the stroke waffle yeah and i mean as the stroke waffle is being funneled into their society would they start then to now that they have something to thrive on they can actually kind of like multiply yeah yeah instead of slowly withering away and dwindling they will start to they'll experience a boom for a while the boom the boom comes before the crash they don't they don't start to uh regress into fat amorphous blob people who have everything done for them by machines so that they can spend more time eating stroke waffle so at least for now they still do their own toil and use the stroke waffle as vital sources of calories while at the same time developing a, I guess kind of a cult around Tucker and Todd. Yeah, because we're the giver. We are the. We give them the stroke. <laughs> the stroke givers. Yeah, we are the stroke givers. The the town elder names us the new town elders and leaders. Oh, you guys are just better at it. Well, because for now we're managing to keep the source and production of stroke awful a secret, so it just. To them, it seems like it just comes from us. But we have definitely damned them to follow the same path as their neighbors. <laughs> the stroke. Yeah, this is playing the entire time. Anytime anybody's talking about stroke waffle. Yep. That is uh, communion will now be called giving the stroke. <laughs> so we, we giving feed, and receiving. Yes. We feed our supplicants the stroke waffle. You will now receive the stroke. And so it's time for Tucker to look to Todd. And say, you said this place was a dump. Look at us now. We're in charge. We own our own town. How awesome is that? And then that's probably the perfect opportunity for like the famous last words thing. Somebody to discover that all the stroke waffle comes from a, uh, like a machine and that they don't need us. Oh, we get kicked out of town right at the end. But yeah, we can be like, how about that? We're in, we own our own town. We're in charge. We're the boss now. This is great. We can have as much stroke awful as we want and everybody does what we tell them. And then that's the perfect opportunity for like a like a Molotov cocktail to be thrown through our the window to our small estate because they found the machine and it's not Bert Kreischer. <laughs> we don't need you we... anymore. We have your secrets now. We are the gods. Yeah, I guess we live long enough to be the heroes that they blah, 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 or whatever. Yep. Basically, we managed to fail to keep a lid on our own production and outlive our usefulness to these people. They don't need oh, us no. anymore. So, yeah, we get ejected from town. 
they've seized the means of production. <laughs> That's exactly what's happened. So somebody out there, somebody in there wrote a book. Karl Marx shows up, sees the means of production. And so the, uh, and since they're in a commune, that's a perfect time for a communist manifesto. I'm just trying to think of how how would the communist manifesto be particularly focused? Or it's all just about stroke waffle. It, yeah, and it's all about seizing the means of production of stroke waffle specifically. So it's a much shorter book, but I mean it's a pretty good read. It talks about how important it is that the people of the commune serve stroke waffle directly and not its representatives so we get shit canned i think it that is means, good that, we that get means shit -canned. that means we've been kicked out of two places in one episode well because i was i was resident we be we could become the kings of this place and then whoever ends up tracking us to that place struggles to pull us away from it because we don't want to go back to not having over any power over anything oh yeah no we definitely need to ruin it all by ourselves i also like that wh whoever does track us to that place they find us we're not there anymore yes it's gonna have to we're gonna go with the rule of three on that one because first the mandela lorian tracks us down Plus a couple other places on our list to visit oh yeah for sure but for this one episode at the very least the mandela the mandela lorian tracks us down to the social concerts factory then to the gnome uh gnome hound uh terminal and then to this town the natural state and every time he misses up he misses us by a little bit less so he's getting closer and faster yeah so should we we've been kicked out of this place should we find other some other means of transportation or are we just rambling we probably just go for a walk now because the the sled is gone and there are no vehicles in production either here or in the nearby town that aren't like specifically in service to stroke waffle transportation. Ooh, and then so maybe that's actually a good way. Maybe this is beginning. We're on a bit of a we we're, we we that we end here like holding our thumbs out trying to hitchhike or whatever. But the, on the next episode, we can open. It's been however long we've been wandering in the desert, and we come across some sort of like uh, an oasis kind of place is whatever our next place is. Oh, I like that. We're standing on like a dirt path with our thumbs out, just like walking, hoping somebody will give us a lift. Tumbleweed comes by, tries to eat us. Yeah. Tumbleweeds, man, that shit's dangerous. And then, yes, I suppose either either it closes out on us, like walking into the horizon down this road with our thumbs out, or we do kind of start stumbling upon an oasis, and that's where we f leave the boys. Well, I don't have any ideas right now of what it would even be. Some room of requirements place in the desert. I like that, that it shows up as we need it. So I guess we don't need it now. We're not currently on the verge of like imminent death or anything. We're just like sorely inconvenienced by being kicked out again. So we're just hitch hitchhiking off into the distance and evading man-eating tumbleweeds. Yeah, I would want to take time. I feel like we have so many premises that we've never actually tapped. And I don't know what I want to do next week yet. We've got all week to consider it. Yeah, so I don't know what it is. We're just wandering in the desert. Yep. there. Somehow this desert has a path and we're just hitchhiking along it. Although it would be pretty funny to hitchhike through the middle of a desert where there is no road and no expectation of people passing through it. Because then you've got your thumb out for nothing. Just hoping. So uh, as we walk off into the horizon, into the distance, uh, a tumbleweed probably blows down this little path. And you can hear somebody say, ouch, I suppose that's fine. And then that's an opportunity to transition away from that scene to the Mandela Lorian arriving at each of these locations. Because, of course, he's going to bump into house. So it's probably the scene where he well, to have our... go on. Does it make sense to right at the end cram in seeing him arrive at all three locations, or should we have been peppering in him arriving at those locations somewhere else throughout the episode, and now we just end up a prolonged shot of him showing I up? Was, at the... I was actually thinking that 
this entire thing would actually end just with the scene of him landing at the social construct factory and entering it. Like, oh, okay. He just shows up at the very first place that was our last one of our last known locations. So the hunt is now officially on, and he's on our trail. So either he just enters, or he uh, enters, makes it far enough inside for Greg House to see him, and then Greg House is going to have to say the same thing he probably, I assume, he said to us when he first saw us previously, which is a uh, practiced and very unenthusiastic tour guide line and then that would be where it cuts out that works for that one and then the next episode could start with him we we don't need to see him visiting the second place we went to the gnome hound station we could end up with are him you visiting. sure because i want him to interact with george carlin i mean gnome carlin oh i guess yeah gnome carlin is funny okay then there's no reason that he doesn't have to i mean they don't they don't have to but even a, a brief peek Maybe maybe that would be where it begins is like at the very end of his investigation there and Gnome Carlin won't shut up. So he just like leaves and Gnome Carlin's still talking. Yeah, it, it begins with him trying to get away from the, the, the station, but Carlin just keeps trying to like chew his ear off about whatever story he's telling. You'd think gnomes would talk enough to each other, but I guess they don't. Well, some people are just extroverts. And also his entire gnome sled team have bits in their mouths, so they can't talk anyway. But I think that's a good place to end it. Him arriving at the social construct factory and coming and encountering Greg House. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Which makes it a, an appropriate cliffhanger. And it keeps all of the balls in the air. Everything's addressed properly. And we have an idea of where to start next week, but we'll we'll comb through our premises and see what we can see that we can squeeze in there. Yeah. And I guess we can actually start, because we're approaching, we're on the other side of the halfway mark, we can kind of figure out what the end point of the season is going to be and start setting up what we're moving towards in that direction. And for that, we will definitely need Jeff Bridges to make it to the Abaddon Space Station in his uh, big clunky Ironmonger suit. Right, we're going to have to do that next week, maybe. Yeah, because we're going to need to use Elrond and Fantasology stuff to close it all up. Cool, well that is planning that we can work on then. Yeah, I think I think that's been an episode. That has been another episode of the Tucker and Todd cast. A little tired. Yes, extremely. But 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 pretty good. Yeah. You've been Todd. You've been Tucker. And this has been a cast. Bye. Bye bye everybody. Fuck Tucker, Tucker sucks. And fuck Tucker's friend Todd.